Well, those are two fantastic lectures. And uh, of course, it's always hard to follow your mentor and the guy who wrote the book. <laughs> but uh, uh, I was asked to speak about bone defects um, and specifically about different bone transport techniques. So we're not going to cover the um, free fibular transport, right? Because that's not really a uh, bone transport technique from the same limb anyway. Um, so how do we deal with these large bone defects that occur after tumor excision? Well, um, a lot of the principles are the same and no matter how uh, the patient ends up with a bone defect, no matter the etiology, whether it's post-traumatic or, or whether it's oncologic, there are some nuances of oncology like timing of chemotherapy and radiation therapy, et cetera, uh, that would play into your decision to when to transport and, and things like that. Um, also, after tumor, you tend to have a much more sterile field than, um, than after a traumatic reconstruction. But uh, that being said, uh, we're going to look at some principles. And, and Dr. Rosberg already went over a lot of these principles and showed some fantastic cases. Okay. Disclosures. So I'd like to start with um, a case of a colleague of mine. Uh, and... Uh, of course, Roberto knows this colleague well, Steve Quinnen. And Steve Quinnen has, has kind of taken cable transport to uh, another level uh, with the balance cable transport. I think this is a really interesting technique. He's won many awards for this. And, you know, it's, it's, a, cable, it's a way of doing cable transport. Now, this is cable transport without using a nail. So it's just straight cable transport. And how do you keep that segment from waving around and doing strange things? So let's see what Steve does. Here's a patient who ends up with a bone defect, right? So this is a pretty significant bone defect. He decides to put a spacer in to keep the skin um, in a better position from, from getting sucked into the wound. But that said, um, you don't have to do that. So here he has his cable. Here he has a pin that the cables wrap around. And here he has his corticotomy. And he's going to just slowly pull the cables down by pulling out the two sides and the, and the bone transports down. There's really almost no internal structure here over which this is transporting. There's no in, intermedial nail or anything. And this is kind of what the setup looks like. The cables go in perpendicularly, right? So when we do these, we've learned to have them come out at an angle and pull through. He has them come perpendicular, wrap around a pin and then go up the canal. So that gives some internal structure to the cable transport and, and allows for docking to be perfect or close to perfect every time. And this is just basic distraction osteogenesis after you've done the setup. So he, he sees you can do large defects, even just one level transport. He's also done two level transports. Um, in this case, it's a one level transport. You see the corticotomy growing as it goes, as it goes, as it goes. And then it starts to consolidate after docking and the docking site ends up healing faster than the lengthening site. And this is a great victorious case, 18 months post-injury, the patient's out of the frame. So um, he's had excellent results with this, but, but realized that his external fixation index is quite high. People are wearing their frame for a long time. Well, what if we can pull on Rob Rosbrook's technique of lengthening and nailing? And that's what he's doing now a lot of is cable transports, and then as soon as he docks, he puts a nail in, reams through the regenerate, and gets fantastic bone healing at all sites, and cuts down to frame time. So the last guy was in the frame 18 months. Okay, we saw that. Here's another patient with a bone defect, albeit a much smaller defect, uh, similar strategy. Okay, he's going to transport this piece down, the corticotomy's here, the cables are here. You can see there's almost no fixation on this whole long segment. So that's kind of interesting and not exactly what we're all used to doing. This gets pulled down. Um, the distraction's a millimeter a day. And he's got full distraction here. He docks this. And then three months docking, he takes a patient back to the operating room to put a nail in. This patient's been in the frame for three months, three months and five days. So that's a tremendous cut down on his, his uh, external fixation index. And then he also found that 
the whole thing actually filled in faster too, which is what, what Rob and I found with the Latin study we did, that it's 8.5 months to full consolidation. So there's one strategy for dealing with the bone defect would be cable transport or cable transport and nailing. Well, let's come back into our practice, cable transport over nail. Rob taught me this technique. And here's a, a patient of Rob's that's just a fantastic case. And I'm definitely not gonna do as good a job as Rob at presenting this, but I'll give it a shot. Here's a patient who had a tumor resection that was reconstructed with allograft um, and ended up uh, having the entire allograft fail over time um, and was back to having a massive defect of the femur and was um, told that probably an amputation might be his best option. Uh, and then he, he found Dr. Rosbrook. And you can see that this looks like it's completely eaten away. Um, and that's kind of typical of an infection in an allograft. So allografts don't hold up over time. They tend to fracture, crumble, or they can get infected. You can get a latent infection, <clears throat> like a hematogenous infection of your allograft, you know, from some random event. Um, and then, you know, you've had this allograft for 20 years and suddenly you're back where you were 20 years ago, right after your tumor section, and you need a massive um, bone defect filler, right? 21 centimeters, that's a huge defect. Um, so hip disarticulation, total femur, these were the ideas that were getting tossed around. Um, but Rob had a much more clever strategy here. And the strategy was uh, first to eradicate infection, um, do an exchange nailing, put cement in, and to uh, get this sterile, and then to do cable transport over a nail. And the patient has an IM, a new IM nail in place and has a large defect, has two corticotomy sites, which we'll see in a second, and has cables pulling the fragments from both ends. So it's a trifocal transport pulling from both ends toward the middle. The purpose of this frame is really just to give a, a, a base to anchor the cables onto. Otherwise, he has internal fixation holding his bone. So here's the IM nail. It's a busy slide, but here's the IM nail. You can see it tracking here. It's locked, distal, it's locked distally, locked proximally. Here's a corticotomy. It's getting pulled down from the distal cables. And here is a corticotomy here that's getting pulled up from the proximal cables. So uh, very elaborate, very sophisticated, and at you know half a millimeter to a millimeter a day at each site, which that needs to be checked every two weeks to decide how the regenerate's forming. Um, this transport comes in from both ends and ends up meeting in the middle. You can see that those are the directions of the transport segment. There's the pulleys. Patient's able to get up, he's able to walk during treatment. He's got double fixation, so it's pretty stable actually for ambulation. So once the two pieces meet in the middle, then Rob went back and did bone grafting, put a plate on, which is around the nail, and a simple recon plate. And he decided to leave the external fixator on just for a little extra stability because these were such short segments. He didn't want to lose control of the fragment and Despite having internal external fixation, um, this was being well tolerated and was not infected at this point. So a good strategy to just keep the extra bit of fixation. And this is bone grafted. And then once the regenerate started to fill in, then the external fixator was no longer needed. So Rob took that off. And now he's just waiting for union here. Patient does go on to union. What's really remarkable is he can actually bend his knee. That's really amazing, honestly. If you've done elaborate femur transports with, with frames, with the wires pulling through, knee flexion is not always gonna come back. So the cables really helped without um, tethering the soft tissue too much. So the patient has knee flexion. Continues to do better and better and better to the point where his knee flexion's so good that he's like a speed demon on his bike. And Rob has a nice video where he's racing him. <laughs> and Rob let him win. <laughs> All right. Um, so cable transport over nail, really interesting tactic. 
So I utilize this on a patient who basically had no knee. So what do you do if you have a mega prosthesis of your knee, it gets infected in a young person, um, there's only so many knee replacements you can do. And once you have an infected knee replacement in a young person, patient's 29 years old, it's either amputation or fusion. And that's actually not a simple decision. So after much discussion, meeting with amputees, et cetera, <clears throat> this patient felt very strongly about not having an amputation. He can always get an amputation, right? He wanted to do the knee, to do the knee fusion. So the idea was we had to get rid of all this infected metal and fill this in with bone. So again, we have a large bone defect and cable transport over nail, I thought was a, a good tactic to do this. And of course I learned this from Rob. So here's a cement spacer keeping the skin. The skin is really socked in. So similar to what Quinnen might do, keeping a spacer here to keep the skin from pulling into the site. Um, there's a cable here, there's a long femoral nail, which you can see better in this picture. So we have a long knee fusion nail, maintaining the 15 centimeter defect. There's an osteotomy around the nail and the cables are then going to pull this segment down. Once they hit the spacer, I'll just take the spacer out and then we'll just keep going. So here we go, we're transporting. Here the spacer has come out. Keep going, fast forward at, this, this guy didn't make bone very well, so he's going at half a millimeter a day. You can imagine how long it took to go 150 millimeters at half a millimeter a day, almost a year. So he comes all the way down, finally docks, and then at the docking, pretty typical, uh, I went in and did bone grafting and put a plate around the nail, took the external fixator off, and since we were there, bone marrow aspirate to this, this 15 centimeter lengthening site at the same setting. So first we aspirate the iliac crest bone marrow, centrifuge it, then I make the approach over the crest and harvest the graft using an acetabular reamer and then pack that into the defect site. Um, that's as far as this patient's gotten, but I expect that this will heal up in a relatively short amount of time. Okay, so what do we do if we have proximal Femoral, proximal tibial defect. So we've seen some pretty cool techniques. We're using nails, using cables. This all relies on the idea that you have enough bone to get a pin and wrap the cables around it, um, or you have enough bone that you can control the segment with your cables when it docks, or that you can put an IM nail in and then put cables around it. What if you don't have much space? Here's a patient who has a proximal tibial defect. And on CT, you can see that he really only has about two centimeters of proximal bone and one centimeter is intraarticular. So we don't have a lot of room to work here. Maybe you can get some sort of plate on there, maybe do a plate assisted bone transport. It's possible. I wasn't super comfortable with that. And this piece was a little bit tenuous. I didn't want to go poking a lot of holes in it. So I thought fine wire fixation was, was time tested technique and, and optimal for this case. So uh, again, soft tissue was an issue here. We had to be a little bit careful about that. And I ended up using a classic, what I'll call classic hexapod uh, fixator technique in order to get five or six wires through this proximal segment to get excellent stability, didn't have to span the knee and uh, was able to control the piece well and then just do sort of a typical bone transport corticotomy distally, transport the whole segment up, dock it into the proximal segment. And of course, distal transports, you move it about half a millimeter a day. So again, this takes a while. And then once docked, we can do a BMAC if needed to uh, speed up the process. And you can see the regenerate forming here. Meanwhile, this is healing here. The nice thing about the hexapod is I can adjust varus valgus flexion extension here while I'm waiting for the docking to heal. I can fine tune that alignment while also lengthening down distally and fine tuning translation, et cetera, at the distal site. He ends up doing very well, has full ankle range of motion, full knee range of motion, reestablishment of all his axes. Um, and you know, I was very happy with the choice to use this technique for that defect. Um, what if we have a defect of the soft tissue as well? Well, in a lot of cases, we'll end up doing a free flap, but we do have an interesting technique that uh, we're actually all publishing together with Roberto uh, using intentional deformity. So here's a patient who has a 
a dead segment of bone that needs to be resected that will give him a defect. Contaminated hardware, loss of soft tissue coverage, and the strategy was to cut the nail in half, actually. So it's infected. I don't really want to go digging around his knee to try to get this out. So I just cut the nail in half and pulled it out both ends to completely avoid the knee joint and getting that infected. So after debriding soft tissue and bone down to viable tissues, then we're left with this. And this defect, although it's not a big defect, there is this whole soft tissue component that's kind of an issue. And it's either like get a free flap or twist the tibia in such a way that we can get the wound to close. And that's essentially what I did. I put a hex pod frame on, did some rotation, some varus, some recurvatum. Um, this picture shows that if you just shorten, what the soft tissue does is it widens and you get a bigger hole and it does not cover the defect at all. Whereas if you induce some deformity and how much deformity and in what directions does depend on the wound to some extent, although with this publication that we're going to have soon, it actually shows what the most common deformations are that can get the wound to close. And typically it's rotation and recurvatum and varus will, will get the wounds to close. So I was able to get a tension-free closure just by putting a little bit of deformity in. We left him deformed for about a month till the wound looked solid and then pulled him straight and then went back and did a distal tibial osteotomy and a bone transport. So gradual correction of the intentional deformation and then lengthening distally. So another way to deal with a defect, if you have a soft tissue defect and a bone defect is to intentionally deform it to get it to heal. He didn't need a free flap. It looks like he never had any skin issue at all. So that's a really powerful technique. Um, when I was a fellow, Rob had a patient where he did a transverse tibial transport and it, it was really neat. So um, I had a patient come in who had uh, a, a defect. So here, it's not so obvious on the defect, but after debridement and straightening of the tibia, this patient ended up having a several centimeter defect. Um, so you may see this with tumor patients with allografts that have sort of collapsed and they're kind of still walk on it, that the fibula hypertrophies. And you see how large his fibula is. His fibula is actually as large as his tibia. So I wanted to take advantage of that and take a piece of fibula and pull it into the tibial defect because it was already hypertrophy. Like the biggest problem with transverse tibial um, transport is that you have this skinny little piece of tibia that needs to hypertrophy over six to 12 months. Works faster in kids than in adults. This is an adult, but this fibula is already pre-hypertrophied. How easy is that? We just pull it in and it doesn't even have to hypertrophy. It just needs to heal. So that was the strategy here. So this was an infected non-union. Um, I, I uh, took out the segment of bone that was non-viable. And then we're looking at about a five centimeter defect here. Um, and that would be the piece that we had pulled in. And this is just a basic, basic hexapod frame in order to get the pieces translated correctly and angulated correctly. And then using olive wires off of that to pull the piece into position. And that's very manual, a lizard off type of transport. We pull the piece over. Okay, so then this fractured. So he was, he was docked, he was healed, I compressed him. And when I felt he was healed, I took his frame off and then he fractured. And that's not uncommon after this. When you do these uh, fibular transports, it's not uncommon that they fracture, but that's okay. Even a free fibula, if it fractures, it tends to heal more robustly after the fracture. So he fractured, I put him back into an external fixator and had him just simple frame, had him just walk on it. And then this went on to, to heal very strongly. And you know, at this point, this is not gonna refracture. And this is living bone, right? So this is autologous living bone. Um, the last concept I wanna show you is the new bone transport nail. So this is not new, new, but relatively new. Um, so 
we've, we understand a lot about bone defects now. Here's a patient who has a cement spacer in. This is his defect. It is about 11 centimeter defect. Now that's pre-debridement. So after debridement, it may actually not be quite as big as that. It may be more like 10 centimeters. Uh, this nail is able to give you 10 centimeters. So the idea here is that if you have a bone defect that that uh, you think that you could potentially use the new bone transport nail. So the nail locks proximally, locks distally, and has this big long slot. And the slot will actually drive your transport segment distally. The slots can differ based on the length of the nail. So here's a slot that's located proximally, here's a slot that's located more centrally. So what happens is I would send these films to Nuvasiv and they would then do templates for me and we'd have a discussion, the engineer and I, <clears throat> on where to make the corticotomy, um, how much length I can get out of this, what to expect, should I graft it distally, you know, will it reach, um, et cetera. So that's an important discussion. So here's templating done by the company, sent back to me. We discussed all these different options. And again, here's the case. So it depends how you measure it. Is it 11 centimeter defect? Is it a nine centimeter defect? It will depend on what I end up resecting, but I want to make sure that I have a nail that can handle whatever the defect is going to be. So in this case, I went in, did the resection, and this is the bone transport nail. It is locked proximally with three screws, one, two, three. There's a posterior blocking screw. There's a lateral blocking screw to prevent valgus. So we're still worried about getting valgus when we do a bone transport. We're very worried about getting flexion. The corticotomy is quite high. Corticotomy has to be in between the transport screw, which is this thinner screw, and the proximal locking screw. And then in the lateral, again, you see it's this is a very proximal osteotomy. That posterior blocking screw is really important. And what I suggest for this, um, you need a really proximal starting point. So you can see this is a nice proximal starting point. You know, could I have left a nail longer? The problem is I don't have a, a large distal segment. So I have to kind of defer to that from the length. And there's not a lot of length options. So I kind of didn't worry about this and tried to sink this as deeply as possible to get my best fixation distally. So that was a strategy there. But still, nice high start point, which will help prevent flexion. We want to prevent flexion. A posterior blocking screw, really as close as I could get to the osteotomy site and still have stability. So my suggestion, what I do is I'll put the nail in after I ream, before I make the corticotomy, and I'll, I'll put it all the way down, mark where it's gonna be, I'll take a K wire and drill it into my osteotomy site and put my blocking screws in with the nail in. And I'll pull the nail back out, go back and, and make the osteotomy. My blocking screws were already placed just after I put the nail in. And the nail, will not you will not flex here with the nail if you haven't made your osteotomy right so your blocking screws will be in a really good place so i did that last time and that worked really well if that makes sense um so this case is still pretty young but uh bone transport here we're going at so i go very slow on these and we've kind of learned that from the first few that that were done i'm at 0.15 three times a day um, I'll move it up to four times a day if necessary, but 0.15 millimeters three times a day. So less than, a, less than half a millimeter a day of lengthening. And this bone is healing really nicely at that rate. I don't see any flexion. And right now he's about halfway there. He's, he's lengthened 41. He still has 41 to go down here. So it ended up being an eight centimeter defect after resection. And what I will do is when he contacts, you can see that the back is gonna hit first and there'll be a little bit of a defect anteriorly. I'm planning on flap elevation and bone grafting the docking site. Um, I watched Steve Quinnen's talk yesterday and I think it is a concern if you over compress that this will go into valgus. So again, if you just put bone graft in, you don't have to compress it that strongly to still get it to heal. So that's the strategy with, with that case. 
So that's all I have to say right now on uh, bone defect management strategies. These are concepts that, that uh, one needs to consider each time that they have a bone defect and, and you want to think about what's the best for this patient.